John, I got three questions for you. Have fun with them. Your favorite sports movie? Young Blood. <laughs> really? With yeah, Rob Lowe? Yeah, it was one of my favorites. Bring us together, you're a team, a family. Wow, I was not expecting that. Um, of all the soccer players in the world, not including any you've coached, who you feel is the absolute best? Paul Gascoigne, because he's from Newcastle. Ted Lasso or Wrexham FC? Oh, I've never watched Ted Lasso. because people that possible? Because people keep mugging us off saying I'm, I'm like Ted, Ted Lasso, <laughs> so I won't watch it. No, no, Wrexham FC has been brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Hey, listen, we believe that uh, Ryan Reynolds might watch the CBC once in a while. Any advice for him? Get into coaching. I think he's, he's, got, a, he's got a career ahead of him. Well, let's learn a little bit more about John. From obscurity to unforgettable, this... Overcoming the odds. That's the story of Canadian soccer these days, and it's not a bad way to describe John Herdman. Though he never played at the elite levels, that's where he wanted to coach. So Herdman left his home in England to work with New Zealand's national women's team. Then Canada came calling. It's all changed, a new coach in John Herdman. He guided the women to back-to-back -to -back Olympic medals and laid the foundation for this. To win it for Canada! Canada gold! He took over the men's team in 2018, then ranked 94th in the world. Now they're headed to the World Cup. So here we are, just weeks away from the World Cup, you know, the biggest games for Canadian men's soccer in, what, 36 years? Are you getting much sleep? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I get sleep. Um, I'm pretty normal that way. Um, but I do wake up in cold sweats thinking about Kevin De Bruyne or Romelu Lukaku, you know, there's, there is that reality check that, you know, we're going up against some giants in world football here, and it's just not a place Canada's been for a long time, so a lot of uh, excitement but the opportunity, but you've also got that little nagging feeling in the back of your, back of your mind that um, this is going to be tough. We're going to talk a lot more about the World Cup in a sec, but I want to talk about you for a moment. Uh, you know, it's quite a journey from England to New Zealand to coming to Canada and, and guiding the, the women's national soccer team to, to the podium at the Olympics and then switching over to the men's team. And as I understand it, you felt you had to leave England to, to build the credibility as an elite coach. T tell me about that. I think, you know, leaving England was multifaceted reasons you you know you were working in a professional football academy and you could sense that the career pathway was was limited unless you played at the highest level at that time so for me it was yeah you're gonna have to adapt or or get stuck in in a rut so you know moving to New Zealand was a was a big risk at the time but Oh, we loved it. Best, best decision me and my wife have ever made. It was 10 years of massive growth as a coach. So many opportunities with their, their commitment to coaches and coach development in New Zealand. Probably one of the best in the world at developing people, which I think created the foundation I needed to come to a place like Canada, where, to be fair, women's football, there was big expectation. You go from the women's national team, which you helped lift up to being one of the elite teams in the world, to the men's national team, and you have said it was not easy at the beginning. We, we took some heat. There was a lot of misogyny around whether a women's coach could coach men and handle the locker room. But uh, over the time, I think we've slowly proven people wrong and, more importantly, just brought this dream to the country that, that they've been waiting for. Was it a challenge for you at all, as somebody who's not from Canada, to try to instill in this team the sense of how important it is to represent Canada? Like, how do you sell that to them? I think the players want to represent Canada. What, what I could sense with the players in, in moving over is they've never really been asked those questions, why? You know, why do you wear that shirt? And then creating a commonality to, you know, why we're going to band together and fight together. And I think over time, every camp, we got more clearer on what that purpose was. We were able to establish a clear code of the shirt that it was clear the environments previous had been too permissive. You know, the, the culture was supportive, but not demanding enough. 
and the players weren't holding each other accountable. And I think then belief comes when you start achieving some of the things that you set out to achieve. We were setting, you know, internal records every game, every year. And when you are achieving those things, this belief starts to grow, which then cements the, the purpose and, and the collectivity comes, which they call their brotherhood. And then there are the inevitable setbacks along the way. Alfonso Davies, certainly, you know, may, maybe your best player, certainly maybe the best known, um, had an inflammation of the heart, missed a, a game uh, a year ago, was it now? Um, and then got kicked in the head during a collision. <laughs> I mean, w when, you, when you heard that news, this was in club play when he was in Munich, how did you react? I mean, that whole qualification campaign, you know, when we got the news, Davies would miss seven of 14 games. I think many people thought Canada's uh, best shot of qualifying had now gone, but what was crazy about that was that January window, it was our toughest window. We had to travel to Honduras, back to Canada, then to El Salvador. We won all three of them games, and there was something about them not being there that brought the best out of everyone else. And, we have a next man up philosophy in this team and I think uh, everyone's bought into that. And then the pay dispute uh, for the team, which also led to, what, the cancellation, I think, of a game. You're in a tough position as the coach. You work for, for Canada Soccer. Your players are having a dispute with Canada Soccer. How, how did you handle that? It was difficult. Look, it's, uh, it's a situation you don't want to be in as a coach. You understand and respect where the players are coming from. They believe strong in, you know, the work that had been put in, a body of work over a period of time. They've been putting their careers on the line. They left their families behind. They traveled in COVID conditions. They'd gone to countries that were deemed unsafe. So you, you understood it because I was there in the fight with them. You can empathize and on the same, on the same line, you've got Canada soccer that haven't been to a World Cup for 36 years. You've got a team that's growing exponentially on the field and an organization that's trying to adapt to those realities. I think you have to be a humanist. You've got to see both sides and understand and then walk that fine line because it took a long time to build trust with these players, a long time. And uh, that, can, that can dissipate in seconds, so it was, it was a really tough moment and you know, I thank Canada Soccer for not putting me in those positions where you could have lost the trust of the players. What is success? What does success look like for you here for the men's team? I think success is that these men enjoy this experience and the country enjoy it. I think it's not being too high, not being too low around this whole experience. Take it for what it is. It's, it's Canada being back on the biggest stage in world football, world sport. It's about small steps. It's about scoring our first goal. I mean, that, that would be a huge success to know this country, get a chance to celebrate a goal, keeping a clean sheet, a shutout, getting a first result, getting a first win, getting out of the group stage, you know, beating one of the biggest teams. I mean, these are all sort of pioneering moments. So success will be to have at least one of them and, and then push to as many as we can, we can capture in this moment. I don't know if it's most of the people watching, but a lot of them know exactly what's happening with your team. But we have a lot of people in Canada who don't know a lot about soccer, but suddenly will become really interested in the men's national team. What should they be looking for at the World Cup? I think they should be looking to enjoy being back, putting away, you know, that Italian jersey or Portuguese jersey or whatever jersey they used to have to wear. You know, they, they live in this country now and Hopefully they can pull on a Canada shirt with pride and, and that key word is pride. You know, we're going up against per perennial contenders in Croatia, Belgium, the number two team in the world, you know, real giants. And for many Canadians, that's the story they, they want to get behind. So it will be an underdog story and we're hoping that you can feel that pride when you watch our team. Um, and you can pull on that red jersey for the first time in a long time. Well, Canada will be watching and we, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you.